All right, yo, welcome back. It's the Combat Chat Podcast with your boys, Shane, Hugh, Trent. Hey, hello. How are you fellas? Good. Hang in there. Hang in. Rona free. <laughs> oh, isn't that good? Oh, if, if you're wondering my test, I came up negative as well. So for all of you that were worrying about me, I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so like today, um, so this episode 131, we have a special guest online. If you're watching the YouTube, you're already kind of seeing him. Just in case you didn't know who he was, let me just do the whole spiel. So he has represented Australia a few times at IFMA Games, which he's won gold twice. He was he is also a WKBF world champion, multiple eruption Muay Thai champion across a few weight classes, top three in the world in the WBC uh, world rankings at, at light heavyweight. It's Charlie, the smiling bub, <coughs> the smiling assassin bub from Razor Muay Thai. How are you, sir? Hey, boys. Thanks for having me. Oh, yeah, no. good, good, good. Thanks for having me. Oh, that's good, man. That's good. Thanks, thanks for coming on, mate. Hey. So, going from there, like when we um get someone first time, we always ask the backstory. Like, how did you start in martial arts? What was your first martial art experience? Uh, well, we did karate a bit when we were when we were kids, mm-hmm. and nothing really went from that. And we started playing rugby league and that. And then, um. I watched the movie Never Back Down when I was a kid. Yes, <laughs> yes. And I watched that and I was like, fuck yeah, I reckon I can do this. And um, yeah, I told, told dad and then he's like, oh yeah, I know, I know, oh, mate. So then we went to the gym and then they didn't have MMA classes and I was a bit buggy because oh. I wanted to be walking around school with no shirt on and I thought I was going to be rich in high school like all they were. And then, but all that happened with the Muay Thai classes. So I thought, oh, mate, so give it a go and then. Yeah, ten years later, here we are. Oh, nice. Man. Hey, who would have thought, like you know, it was like you know, starting out and like you know, want to do MMA, but then just kind of progressed to Muay Thai. But worked out pretty well for you so far, hasn't it? <laughs> Ooh, a little bit of lag there. It's all right. Mm-hmm. You just cut out a bit, then I missed that bit. Ah, uh, it's all right. The internet's not that great in the area that I'm in from that one. But like, yeah, it's just saying, like, um, <clears throat> in terms of like you know, being from wanting to do mixed martial arts and getting to the Muay Thai, it's worked pretty well for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, obviously how it is, um, yeah, I seem to be going all right in Muay Thai at the moment. Um, <laughs> it, started off, it started off a bit rocky. I was um, I was a little shit at school and got in trouble all the time. Mm-hmm. And, um, and my dad ended up pulling me out of it. Ah, yeah. And yeah, I kind of got fat and got in trouble. I was always getting suspended in that from school. And then, um, yeah, from there, my the guy who ran the gym, Anthony Wharton, he was my old trainer. Um, he happened to be a teacher at high school. Oh. I think I would have got suspended for about the fifteenth time or something. And then, um, then yeah, he's like, "Oh, he can come to the gym. Mm-hmm. He can um, he can come back to the gym for free. I'll let you train." And then, yeah, it really took off from there. Oh, yeah. So, like the area you grew up, it's orange, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, Central West New South Wales. Yeah, like yeah, in, in terms of like you know the area there, it's like a pretty rough area that, that you kind of grew up in. Oh, I wouldn't say rough. It's just shit. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing to read <laughs> it's, it's not shit. There's, there's nice people, nice wineries, and that. It's just we're so far away from everything. Like I'm travelling back from Sydney now, and it's still it's three and a half, four hour drive. Like. We're four hours from the beach, but it's it's a really rugby league and rugby union dominated kind of town. Hmm. So it's good that I'm some I'm someone doing something different from there. So, mm-hmm. <laughs> but no, it's, it's not rough. It's more, it's it's yeah, it's weird. It's okay town, I'll say. Okay. Okay, okay is probably the right word for it. <laughs> well, maybe it's like a, it's because there's not much going on. You just have to amuse yourself. Yeah, pretty much. It's, I, I, that's the problem though from the town what happens if a lot of teenagers they we have to amuse ourselves so it ends up in drinking all the time and then going to the pub after work like I'm not saying I'm saying I'm guilty with it too like <laughs> you finish work on a Friday you want to go straight to the pub but that's you got to amuse yourself and I'm just glad I'm actually not half bad at something that I I can amuse myself with well that's it that's definitely right like when you when you started getting into Muay Thai and, like, and competing into it from there how old were you and what was like your first experience? Um, my first actual like experience of uh, the Bedardos had a full force sparring day at a Harley shop in Blacktown, 
And um, they had, I spoke to Reinhardt about this, the stupidest idea that they had the ring in the car park <laughs> yeah. and it would have been about 40 degrees. And I remember the, the first bar of the day, they, um, old mate was like sparring or whatever, he finished the round and the blister on his foot kind of like hung down and all the skin and everything. And then, so that that was the first, they started watering it down after all that and then I came up later and since I was I was fat still, so I was like 80-something kilos, as a 13-year-old, as a all I could do was spar like a 30-year-old dude who was like 90-something kilos. So that was my first experience, got in there. I think I was just throwing spinning back fist galore and then... <laughs> I went all right still, and then I think about four months, that would have been in September, so about two or three months later, I had my first fight, and then I haven't looked back since from there. Yeah. It's funny, like, the, the old outdoor um, fight show always sounds, like, appealing on paper, but then, like, usually if there's no cover, which I think a few shows have done before and found out, yeah, it, it kind of turns into, like, a frying pan. Oh yeah, it's like you put, you can see the steam coming off the mat, and it just it looks horrible. Well, I was lucky. I thought I sparred later on in the afternoon, so I didn't experience it. But it's like walking on hot concrete. It's just a shit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. So, like in, in terms of your style, like especially when it comes to Muay Thai, like you you ventured out a little bit recently in kickboxing, which we'll go over. But like um. You know, was it was the elbow always your first love in Muay Thai? Is it is a primary weapon? My first love in Muay Thai was the spinning back fist. I used to, <laughs> I used to, I used to throw from, I remember because when I was coming up, I was watching um, the Ultimate Fighter, and they did like a comeback series. Mm, yeah. That Matt Serra one, and Matt Serra got knocked out by Shoney Carter with the spinning back fist. Oh, yeah. Yes, I remember that. Yeah. And I thought it was the coolest thing ever. So I think my first four or five fights, I made sure I threw about four of them. But then once once I actually started fighting, fighting with help and like started cutting people, people seemed to love it. So I was like, yep, I'm going to keep throwing elbows. And then, yeah, I, I love myself now. I reckon it makes fights more entertaining. If it's, a boring, if it's a bit of a boring fight, as soon as I get into an elbow, elbow exchange, it changes the whole thing. You don't hear many people like, uh, citing Shoney Carter as their inspiration. <laughs> He's definitely definitely not a big inspiration. Because <laughs> I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure he was wearing speedos in that car, in that yeah. fight. So. Oh yeah, not a big inspiration. <laughs> I think they're actually banned from the UFC now. The speedos. Yeah, I remember that. Some guy wore it out, and Dana White gave the um, the guy that beat him a bonus for getting him out there, knocking him out in the first round or something. <laughs> yeah. That's it. We might have to bring it back. <laughs> maybe, maybe it's time for the bob to bring it back. Uh, nah, my legs are too white. I look horrible. <laughs> you and me both. <laughs> so, Charlie, we're getting into um, sort of your starting story there in um, Orange. Uh, these days, you oh, I've been following it on Connie or Instagram and stuff, so pretty interested to, to hear how it came together. So, a couple of years ago, I started to see your um, affiliation change to, to raise in Muay Thai. Um, so you're kind of doing doing your own thing. Uh, you, you put your own kind of training spot together at Razor. Uh, like, what, what's the setup? Did you and a couple of guys put Razor and Muay Thai together? Um, what's the, the facility like? You give us a bit of backstory to how Razor and Muay Thai came to be. Um, so, yeah, I was training with Anthony Wharton at High Impacts for years. Like, he's who I started with. Yeah. And then we, we had a we had a disagreement one thing uh, one one night and that all like went to shit like we're still good mates with him and still probably like, he got me started in the sport so I got all praises to him but we just had we had different point of views about a few things about training wise and it was three weeks before I fought Sebastian Holmes yeah. for the WMC state title and I needed I needed some training I had a couple of mates from the gym that like we, we were holding pads for each other at the time getting each other ready for fights and one of them was um his name's Tristan Roach, and we always called him Razor. And to fight for a WMC title, you have to be locked in with a name, like with a gym name. So, like, I wasn't going to call it Smiling Assassin or Bub Muay Thai. So, he was one of my corners. So, I'm going to stitch him up here. I'm going to call it Razor. And then it kind of just stuck. And then, like, we're training, we're training literally on on the back patio for that fight. 
didn't have a uh, didn't have a ring or anything, didn't have mats, and then then I uh, had that fight with Seb, and wasn't really going to take it. Like, didn't know what I was going to keep fighting, didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't have a gym, like, yeah, I didn't really know. And then Blair Smith messaged me and was like, "Oh, do you want to fight Toby?" I was like, "Oh, fuck yeah, I do, right? I can <laughs> do this." Right? Um, I was a bit worried to start off because I was like, oh, fuck, I don't have anywhere to train. And then my dad had a second house that it was just kind of sitting there because he's, he's actually going to knock it down and build. And he had a shed on it. And I was like, oh, can I use your shed as a training training thing? He's like, yeah, yeah. So I bought a few mats, um, bought a couple of bags, got pads and everything, and then had that first fight with um, first fight with Toby. I had my cornerman from, the, like, from my last fight. Um, worked through that and then like since then I found Denny Mack um, Paul Demicoli actually hooked me up with him so here I've got Denny now I've got Denny Denny Masterchef and Andrew Abbott as my trainers and um, yeah we really became like a little family like Denny's missus is the masseuse and the herbal oils person of the team and um, um, Andrew's missus is um, the hairdresser and She's all pretty much my counselor. We talk. She, she knows everything about me. I talk through all my dramas with him, with her. So, um, yeah, raises we kind of come our little family and our little, um, like our, our everything pretty much. I got I got the logo tattooed on me, and it means that much to me. So, um, yeah, that's how it all came about. It really came from training on training in the back back patio of mum's place. To um, it's literally just a little shed at my house now. That's just the setup. I've got a few boys that come in. A few of the rugby union boys around town, some of my best mates, they need somewhere to train, so they come in, we'll, we'll do sessions, and then Denny has punished, actually gave us a ring um, out of Denny's house. He lives about 15 minutes outside of Orange. So he gave us a ring, and then, um, yeah, we do some rounds out there. We do, like, rounds at my place, do a bit of um, strength and condition at my place, and then I'll come to Sydney and have a spar at um, the Gracie's with Rob and... Um, Izzy and the boys, or I'll go to um, McKinnon, Steve McKinnon's gym and spar with Nathan Robson that day. So, yeah, that's, that's pretty much what raising the risk and how it's going to be. So, how long has it been now? You've been um, fighting at a razor for what would it be? What must be four years or something now? Three years. Three years? Three, three years, I think it is. I put something up about it a while, uh, a couple of weeks ago. I think it's about three years. And have you got um and and, and we've done all right in that three years. <laughs> that we've won, um, I think we're 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 eight we're eight from nine in those three years. I only lost being to Toby, so I think it's going all right. That's that's a good ledger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So like when you um training there as as well, from is it like mainly just kind of pad work, or do you get much sparring in at all? Oh, I don't get like I'm sparring now because. So I'm coming to Sydney. Like Rob, Rob's teams asked me to help out with sparring, but other than that, when I'm fighting, I'll just go to um, like Steve McKinnon's gym with Nathan Robson and Patrick. I don't know how to say his last name. He's got a funny last name. I don't know how to say that, but um, Spunk Goat Boys, or um, my boss, my boy, I'm a carpentry apprentice. My boss actually used to do a bit of kike shin, so he, he asked to come in spar. So we go to Denny's house. We might get a few rounds in there, or. Other than that, all I do is um, I'm probably boxing sparring. Is all the sparring I normally get. As um, as a boxer in town, Jack Littlefield, we've sparred together for about six years now. So he's pretty much my main sparring partner because, like, even when we're not sparring, we still get rounds in every week. Yeah, that, that's a pretty solid work. Still, like, and like, like talking into it now, like. Because you've kind of ventured into like doing more like kickboxing fights, you even had a boxing fight as well, and like we've, like we've seen you fight a few times. Like we we fought on the same show, like a chaos when you fought Mark Timms. Yeah, yeah. Yep. And like I think that's the first time I kind of noticed that I go, "Fuck, Bob's, Bob's got some hands, man!" Yeah. Like <laughs> like yeah. switch hitting and like you know hitting Elkhart Angels, and our our boxing time with Mark Timms is massive. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um. So that's, that's the thing, that fight, I was like, it was my, just before that, I fought that, the Dak. Yeah. I know if you know him, he's one of Tarek Solak's boys. Mm. Um, and I couldn't use elbows. So I, was like, oh, I don't, really didn't know how it was going to go. And we ended up um, 
beating him. And then I knew Mark was going to be real handsy because obviously come from city kickboxing and how, um, I don't know the right word is to, to describe them. They're all just so tricky and all their feints and everything. But I, I thought I was going to beat him with boxing. I haven't actually watched the, I haven't watched the video of that fight, so I don't know exactly what I did beat him with. But yeah, I, I work a lot of my hands. I like my hands. I think they're exciting. Um, and like like you said, it's helped me venture over to kickboxing, like something to use besides elbows. I, I've got that that good kind of um, I don't know what the right word is to switch switch from um, punching to kicks. It's helped me a lot with that, like all the boxing training and that. And um, yeah, having that boxing fight, that boxing fight was actually my last fight since everything's happened. So um, that was a shock. I was fighting a dude. They said he had two pro fights, and I was like, oh yeah. They didn't tell me he had 40 amateur fights. <laughs> he came, oh, it, was, it was real sweet. Um, but yeah, it seemed to help me a lot um, with the boxing, and I, I think I, I put my own little spice on it to bring it into kickboxing and Muay Thai. And do you kind of feel like, obviously, you're really highly rated um, at light heavyweight uh, in the WPC, like closing in on that world title whenever it sort of pops up. Um, and then I, I have seen as well, um, uh, there's been a bit of a push to get you towards one championship, which obviously has a pretty good um, pretty good talent pool close to your way. Being that you transitioned to kickboxing a little bit, do you feel like at that kind of, those sort of heavier weights, like light heavyweight and above, there can be more opportunities in kickboxing than, than Muay Thai past the point? Yeah, there's, def- there's definitely more in um, in kickboxing. Like, you look at the, the Eastern Europeans and all that. They're, that That's where, like the Eastern Europeans, the um, the Dutch, That that's where kickboxing becomes big in the heavier weights. Uh, um, like Muay Thai kind of, your stoppage pool starts to end and then you get the bigger boys the um, the skill level class tends to drop a bit, yeah. so then it goes to kickboxing because like they're more backed on their punches and their kicks. They don't have to work in the clinch. They don't have to work all that. But um, with one championship, they don't like it. Kind of ends the same thing. It kind of ends it like the seventy nine, seventy seven. Like with the um, like your Nicky Holskins, your Reagan Ursels, and that they all fight it. I think it's, I can't remember what the weight division is, 77.6, I think. Yeah, 77. And then above that, not, yeah, then above that, there's not really a, 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 um, like a kickboxing division. And then, like, I feel like from there, that's where your best Muay Thai in the world is going to be, under 76. Your best Muay Thai is going to be at one with, um, with the kickboxing and the Muay Thai. And then you got to jump to glory to get your heavier weight. So that, yeah. that seems to be where, where all your heavier, Kickboxers seem to go, and you can see it happening there. That got some of the best kickboxers in the world at the heavier weights. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, especially with like you know, in terms of like you going from like seventy six, like finding people like Toby Smith and things like that, and jumping up. I, I heard like I was listening to your uh, interview with Mudsy, like you just had recently, and like it, it's like it's a very smart approach that you have in terms of like you know how you manage your weight, being happy going to the fight camp, being fueled up as well. No, um, so was, was that just a very recent change that you made? Um, no, I always we made the change about how I make weight. About when I was still with my old trainer, I hate. I got a phobia of saunas. I got a phobia of saunas and hot baths. I hate them. <laughs> like I, I struggle to have a, a, a Radox or an Epsom salt bath now, just because I hate like the feeling of being overly hot. Yeah. So I I I prefer to struggle. Yeah. Yeah. I'd, I'd prefer to struggle that last week, like through work and that, through not eating and flushing my system, than um, then having to like then eating that little bit and then cutting my weight. So I like to be happy all around. I do what feels good for me. There's gonna, I know there's going to become a point because I'm still 22. I'm still growing. There's going to, I can't make 79 for much longer. So I don't know, it's actually good because WBC of um. They put in a new weight range. I think cruiserweight's now 86, I think. I think the jump was, it used to be 79 to a, uh, seventy nine to 90, and now they've added a division in the middle there. Mm. So that, that's going to be good for me. I don't, I'm going to be a lot happier at that division. So hopefully, hopefully like that 79 world title when everything goes back to normal, and then maybe even go up to the 86 range. Yeah, nice. Like, it's... 
it's it's always better if you just kind of come in with one less thing on your mind, like, you know, thinking, oh, fuck, you know, I can't eat this one. I can, you know, have to measure my water out and everything as well from that one. So, yeah, it just seems like a very smart approach. Yeah, I just, I like to be happy. I feel like I'm a happy person and everyone on my team can, can vouch for me. When I'm when we're travelling and I'm hungry before a weigh-in, I'm the worst person to be around. <laughs> like, I'm sure... <laughs> So Hugh can, Hugh can be asked for it when you're hungry. You don't want to talk to everyone. So if someone says a smart-ass comment, you just look at them with hate. Or if someone's, <laughs> yeah. eating, if someone's eating in front of you, like, you, you can't be in the room. It's, I don't think I saw Hugh yeah. smile for the first two, new, two, new, two years that I knew him. <laughs> I didn't know he had teeth. Like, I'm happy, dude. <laughs> <laughs> that was all the weight coming. Definitely, it was. <laughs> um, so, like, uh, talking about like that as well, because like um, you work, um, what do you do? As what's your outside job uh, besides fighting? I'm a I'm apprentice. I'm an apprentice carpenter at the moment. I've got ten months left of my apprenticeship. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's just like, it's just a hard slog, isn't it? If you're just trying to do all that training and like it's a pretty labor intensive job as well, carpentry and trying to make waves. It's like yeah, it's just, it's not worth it, is it? <laughs> It's all right. My, my boss is my boss is good. He's understanding. Like like I said, he used to do kayak and shin, so he actually he has a feel for the sport, and he um he appreciates what I do. So he's all right. Give me days off, and like not being such a dick to me those those days. <laughs> I, feel, I feel sorry for the for the guys that I work with because I'm I'm just an asshole to be around that last week. But I think I could be worse. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, let's put it this way, I'm, I'm not shooting anyone with a nail gun, so it's good. I'm all right. No, yeah. When, when right. I, yeah, when, when I get to that point, I think oh, we'll, we'll start changing a few things. <laughs> the weight thing's interesting, Charlie, because like, when I, I think the first time I fought, like on the same show as you, I think you were fighting it, it would have been 72.5, uh, and I was aware of you before that, like I'd always seen you fight, obviously you were a bit younger, so you were fighting kind of like around that 70, but I remember there was that period of time you had a couple of fights in quick succession at, at, at middleweight. It would have been, if I'm not mistaken, maybe Scott Wilson, and then shortly after that, you fought Alex Ilyoski. Correct me if I'm wrong, I, I think they were kind of close together. And yeah, yeah, that, that Scott was at Cyan, that would have been the yeah. show you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. then... Yeah. I think from there it was like you had a, a, a burst of pretty high level fights in middleweight, and then it seemed like it was like then it was up to 76, and then only a couple of fights there and up to up to 79, and now even talking about maybe going towards cruiserweight. Obviously, a, a big part of that's like you're just young and, and growing. Were you like really struggling to cut weight and you, at, at one point and you just said, nah, screw it, we'll fight heavier? Or is it just like you just outgrew the classes and found you were getting too heavy? I wasn't, I wasn't struggling. I was happy making weight at 72. Um... But if you look at the photo when I fought Alex, uh, my, like, I'm nothing. I'm, yeah. I'm skip bone. And then because as soon as I fought Alex, I think five weeks later, I fought Jake Lund, and that was my first fight at 76. Yeah. So I had that not cut and weight. And then uh, just after that, I fought, I think I fought Odin Daniels just after that, and even that was at 74. And then after that, I fought Brett McCluskey, and that was at 74. So I never went back down to 72. I, I still could have, I feel. Yeah. I still feel like I could have went back down, but um, like they were all catchway fights, and then I have a tendency to get fat over Christmas. <laughs> and I, I, I don't know if it's true. Don't, I'm not a scientist, but the, I think the way, because like we deplete our bodies so much during the year, if we bite four or five, six times, we don't have a chance to grow, and then over Christmas, if we give ourselves that food, that extra food, it just stays on us. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if that's that's true or not, but it always felt like me after Christmas, I'd struggle to make that. Like I'd, I'd be fit, I'd get my weight back down, but then I'd, I've obviously grown a little bit being so young, so that I couldn't make that extra little bit. Yeah, you know what I mean. So yeah, after that period, like it went from 76, 74, 74. I think I made 74 one more time against Peter Lagodsky. And even that was um, that was up in Townsville, so that was easy to sweat. And yeah. then I went to my trainer, like, I'm not making 74 again. Then I made 76 a few times. And then I think after I fought 
Stefan Lottery, and I fought him at C at 76. I told Danny, I'm, I'm not making 76 again. I can go get fucked. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, but yeah, as you said there, like you know, just because like you know, training fighters and like yeah, and this guy's going through it a bit as well. Now I was like, you make a weight so much that you keep fighting, making weight, and then your body, yeah, it doesn't have time to grow because it's it's always in depletion. And then when you let yourself go into a surplus, like over Chrissy and that, build some good muscle up from that. It's like then you come back, you go, oh, I'm like, I'm feeling pretty good, I'm a bit lean, but getting back down to that weight is like, yeah, it's it's, it's too much because you'd be cutting muscle. Yeah, it, it, yeah, it, it, it's like you, you, your natural body weight changes. I think like now, now it's a bit different because I don't actually know what my natural body weight is now. I'm sitting around ninety, but I don't know with COVID because I'm not doing pads every day and I'm not running. Like I'm still training, but I don't know what my natural body weight is now. So it'll be interesting to see when everything goes back mm. how how the weight cut goes. But yeah, I, that, that's just that's that's how I've. I think it is like you give yourself that little bit of that little bit of um, that food, that extra bit your body needs, that R and R, and your body thanks you for it. But like when it thanks you for it, it gives you that little bit of love on top of it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, at the moment, like um, you, like there's no fights happening at the moment, really. But like um, before that, like you, you kind of like you, we just list off the names and like you know every division is like it's a huge names that you fought, like. If it comes to like Muay Thai and, and I don't know, kickboxing, whatever from there, is there still fights in Australia that, that need to happen that, that you think? I'm always going to say Jake won because we're one apiece. I thought you might but, say that. Yeah, he's, he's obviously, that, that's, I don't understand, he's retired now. He won the WBC title and he retired, all props, all props to him for doing that, but that's always a fight I thought was going to happen. Mm. But... Obviously not. Um, everyone wants to see a Toby rematch. I feel, yep. um, but again, I don't. I don't know how Toby's weight was. I think he only sits mid mid eighties, so he he's pretty comfortable making seventy six. So unless unless it's a big money, a big money thing, I don't think we'll fight at seventy nine. And I definitely can't make seventy six. So like that's it'll, it'll compromise me way too much if I can even get there. But um. Like that, they're, they're, they're the two in Australia that I'd jump at 100%, but other than that, um, that's, that's, that's why this year was going to be so big. Like we, yeah. we had a few overseas fights planned, but in Australia at the moment, like unless I go up, um, yeah, I, I, I don't really know if there is anything in Australia. Like Stefan's getting good again. He's getting good again. He's always been good. Yeah. Like he's... He's um getting good. He's getting better, I should say. He's getting a lot better. He's getting stronger. So he's going to come to a heap again. Um, if if we've crossed paths again, like that'd be awesome. Um, uh, if if Dave's back fighting Pinnipede, I think he's staying at seventy six. But like that, that's the only fights I, I have in Australia are rematches. Yeah. So I, I really before all this shit happened, I really want to like, take that next step and take on the world. Mm. Well, that, that's a, that's the next logical thing, isn't it? It's just like you know, done it all in Australia. Yeah, you can do rematches, sure, but it's like I think it's time the world knew about Charlie, isn't it? Yeah, like, I got called out after I beat um, after I fought Jade last year. That was actually a year ago tomorrow. Yeah, I'm getting the memories on Facebook and everything. Um, did you fight on that card, Hugh? Yep. Yeah, you fought on that card too. Yeah. yeah so that was that was a year ago. Um, after I fought him, I got fought out by Daniel Bonner. He's from yeah. he's from the UK, and we we're supposed to go. We we're supposed to fight there on not October, um, July twelfth. So we we're, we we're supposed to go over there and fight him then, but obviously that didn't happen. So <laughs> that was going to be the break way. Um, there was talks at the start of the year of fighting. I can't remember how to say his name. I think it's Chip Mal. Mm, chip something pole lad uh, he's a line fight yeah. champion yeah yeah he's a line fight champion um, that'd be good yeah good that, that's what I was as soon as Paulie uh, it was either Paulie or Hammer I think it might have been Hammer that threw that idea at me I jumped at it because that fight would have been at 83 so I would have been that little bit stronger I was like yep 100% let's do it but he chose to fight someone from Greece I think but yeah so and then 
Hammer actually sent me a message that he's trying to get that fight to happen when everything goes back to normal. So they're, they're the big international ones at the moment that were supposed to happen this year. And then, um, yeah, we'll see. We'll, well, when, when we can travel again, we'll see where I can go. That's, that's going to be the biggest thing for everyone, I think. Like Since last year was such a big year for me, it's kind of shit now that I can't really go. Can't go anywhere. No one can come in. So it's going to be a really, really weird future, I think. You, um, you mentioned you were training at uh, Smeaton Grange, and um, Alex Prates uh, has been coaching you a bit in jiu-jitsu, and the game, yep. how's that been going? Are you enjoying it? Yeah, I really enjoyed it. I went, I'm just coming back from Sydney now, I spent, I got there third, I did three days from, I think I did, I think I did like eight, I think I pumped out eight sessions, like five jiu-jitsu, four jiu-jitsu, a couple wrestling and that, nice. it's definitely different, like, yeah. I got, um, I got gay rash all over my chin. <laughs> but it's just it's just good to be something completely different. Like when we went down there sparring last time, I saw the professionalism from them and just how they conduct themselves and I was like, that's something I can get around. But then Alex I mentioned it to him last time and then Alex said, um, Oh, if you want to come down for a couple of days, come down and then I went down there and like it's already like I'm a part of the team with the boys, so they I can't speak wholly enough of them. Um, they've all treated me like a part of the team. They're showing me like bits and pieces because obviously coming from a Muay Thai stance, you have to change so much. But yeah, it's been, been there over the past three days. has been awesome. Are you, are you doing it with a view to transition to, into MMA or, or dip your toe into the MMA waters a bit? Yeah, but that's kind of how it's going. We're seeing like, like we said, there's nothing Muay Thai wise at the moment. So if that, if that's the way we have to go for things to make to make things happen, or if Muay Thai gets dry, that's definitely still an option. So it's good just to have that there as an option. Um, I have spoke to Alex about it. Um, he, he definitely thinks I can do it, and the team there they definitely they're more than willing to to help get me there. So if that's if that's what the future brings, then I'm going to take with both hands and run with it. Is it kind of a matter of wanting to to get that world title in Muay Thai and then maybe transition, or, or you think you would? kind of just change course towards MMA? Oh, that's, that's what I've said. That's what I said to those boys. They've asked me if I'll swap. Anyone back home asks me if I'm going to swap. I want that that credibility in Muay Thai yeah. first. I want that, that WBC. I want a shot at that line fight. Like, uh, if WMC throws, like, we can still do that. I want WMC. I want that. Because everyone in, um, they're either a black belt in this or a, like, they're highly ranked in another thing, and that's that's kind of me getting that big thing in Muay Thai. You know what I mean? Yeah. So like, get get that get that credibility, and then and then if uh, it's like like what um, Adesanya did, get that credibility yeah. in striking, get get that name, and then um, and then not rush the transition. Like that, that's what we spoke about. If we're going to swap over, you know, I don't want to be fighting MMA. At the end of the year or something, I want to be like, I want to do it properly. I don't want some some half ass to beat me because I didn't know this, like I didn't know enough wrestling. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I want I want to do it all properly. I want to do it all proper. So I get that get that credibility in Muay Thai, and then if I swap over, it's going to be that ease back over. Yeah, definitely. So like you know, yeah. So as we talked about training with Alex, who's the trainer of Bob Whitaker and that. Like, um, how did you come about? Like you know, tra- training with the uh, with that camp. Because did, did you help Rob with his last fight, like training was? Yeah, oh, I wouldn't say help. I was just his sparring partner for his last. Mm-hmm. Uh, I did. I really, we did three sessions, so we did fifteen rounds together. Um, mm-hmm. He's he's striking, or his Muay Thai coach Charlie Bich, Bichwadi, I think his last. Mm-hmm. How you pronounce his last name? Yeah, um, that's it. Yeah, he he just messaged me on Instagram with his phone number. He said, "Give us a call." I think I called him at like nine o'clock at night. Because I was excited about, I, I didn't get the message until nine o'clock, and I was like, "Oh fuck, I'll ring him now." And um, he's like, "Yeah, you want to come down and spar?" We went down the first time, um, and then yeah, but I come back two weeks later, come back again, and we got good rounds in, did well with each other. So yeah, and then I kind of mentioned it to him that I might be interested to swap over. So now they've kind of welcomed me as as a part of the team almost, and. Um, yeah, they said they're happy to have me back any time. That's where I'm coming from now. As you say, I've got a bit of a black eye, a few marks. Hmm. We, just fin- we just finished sparring at about 2 o'clock. So, yeah, it's, it's been great with them. 
Yeah, that's it. It's definitely like a great experience. Like, and I guess it, during this time, like obviously it's shit outs for every fighter, like, you know, not getting fights. But it, it, it's allowed you to try something different and like, you know, and, like, and, and also just interact with people that you might not have interacted before. Yeah, exactly. Like it's 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 completely different striking. Um, like with Rob, his striking is so unorthodox. His head kicks are the best head kicks in the world. He actually floored me with one last time, and that's the first time I've ever been dropped by somebody. Hit by dropped by like a head knock. And he kicked me with and I just remember thinking, where the fuck did that come from? Because <laughs> he, he disguised his head kicks so well with his karate stance. And it's just smacked me in the side of the head. And I was like, oh, shit, he's hit me with that. And I remember going to stand up and I was like, yeah, I'm right, I'm right, I'm right, I'm right. And I ended up walking 10 metres backwards. I'm like, oh, fuck, I'm not right. <laughs> so, like, it just shows the difference. It's good to have that different striking. Like, it's not something you normally get in Muay Thai. Like, Muay Thai is very up up straight, yeah. hands guard, but they're, they're changing their levels. Like, my style makes him think, his style makes me think. And even the other boys, like... um, Jacob and Izzy there, they've, they've all got that different style. So although it's unorthodox to Muay Thai, it's still making me think and still helping me too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Like, uh, and it's like, it's good for Whitaker as well. Like, you know, and his team, he's obviously well managed to like, or, uh, to search out like some of the better, like, you know, you know, Jiu-Jitsu guys, Muay Thai guys, and that one to like, you know, give Rod, uh, Rob, like, a, I don't know, a well-rounded approach to like, you know, to his game. Yeah, what what the boys have going on there is exactly what he needs. Like Alex being the head coach, organised everything. Like this morning when I was there, they had um, uh, they had two. They're from Wollongong, two Olympic judos. The the judo, what do you call them? Judo fighters, judo judo players, yeah. judo yeah. joke there. Yeah, yeah they had two, two two Olympic two Olympic um two Olympic who were on the Olympic team and. Uh, I think two more that train with them and they uh, doing rounds with them, like wrestling rounds with them, then rounds with me. Yesterday, they had a Commonwealth wrestler, like an ex one, he came in and taught the class, uh, taught like their our wrestling session. And like Alex and Justin and Charlie, they're, all, they're just feeding them the, like, the best guys for what they need. And it shows one of the, like Jacob, one of the other boys just saw him for UFC too. Um, so yeah, what they're doing there. They're providing the best training for them. They're not leaving any any boxes unticked. They're really doing a good job. Yeah, great. It's great to hear. You know. Um, so going into a little bit now that um, you're you're a huge advocate of like you know of like um, promoting like mental health and like people like speak uh, you know asking for help like after every fight like you, you just say like you know always you know call me up call a mate up from there always talk about your problems and that um, how did you get behind such an initiative? Um, it's actually Sandy who runs the, the Quantum Move Cup. She put a, a message out, I think, to all, like, she had a few from different states and put a message out to anyone from New South Wales if they'd be keen. And I put my hand up and was like, yeah, I'll, like, yeah, I'd be happy to do that. Um, and then it just so happened, as that happened at the end of the year, like, the next year it took off, there were a couple local. Uh, what, what, what part did I cut out at? Uh, pretty much when you started talking to us before, like, you know, like um, how Sandy runs uh, Committed Muka Cup. Yeah, so Sandy, um, so yeah, Sandy sent the messages out and I was like, oh, I'll get behind that. It's a good initiative. And then it just so happened, as that happened, there were a couple suicides in town in Orange and I didn't know any of them personally. Like, I did know, I knew of them, but I wasn't real close with them. And um, just seeing how it affected the community and that it really had to be something we could get behind. And um, so, yeah, that it just it clicked in my head that everyone, like, they need to talk about it. And then you start hearing more, like, I think it was when I fought on Eruption, the second fight when I was a, I became an ambassador was just after Taylor Harvey committed suicide uh, from Maddox Gym up in Queensland. And then... Like, in, until I became, I didn't realise how big of a problem it actually was. I thought it was something that just happened now and then, like, it wasn't much. And then, after being involved in it and hearing stories, like, Denny, my trainer, had a real big connection to it. One of his best mates, Andrew, my other trainer, like, 
he's like, oh yeah, I've had four, like five. He knows five people that are done. It. I'm like, what? Like, which, you, you, you know, five. You know, five people that take cancer. You shouldn't know five people that have killed themselves. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like that's it. It, it just kind of stuck. It just kind of stuck with me, and I was like, yeah, no, nah, we can we can do something. Like I've got the "You Are Worth Fighting For" slogan tattooed on my wrist. I've got where me and Danny have come out with our own video that we're I released on Instagram. We've got another one coming. We're just trying to trying to back that community, um, especially with everything that's going on at the moment. Like they're worried about everyone dying of COVID, and they don't realise more people are dying of fucking suicide than people are of COVID. So. Mm-hmm. It's just, it's yeah, it's just something that we all get behind, and I think people, a lot of people get behind it. So I just, I want, just trying to be that voice for people that don't feel like they have a voice. No, I think it's great. It's a great initiative that you're doing. I think it's a real problem that people still have that uh, stigma attached to it. And as long as it's broken, it's, it's, especially, yeah, especially us being guys, like we're told, we're taught not to be sooky, not to, yeah, not to cry, not to. Like, even as fighters, like, people trying to think, like, oh, yeah, we're tough, we're this, we're that. Like, you cry, I cry. Like, I'm sure you guys have cried. Everyone cries. Like, Every day. <laughs> after you cry, you, you, you feel better. Like, oh. and, and people don't realise that. But I'm, I hope we're changing. Like, if we save one life, then we've made a difference. Like, it's just, there's, it, it, it sucks. It, it doesn't suck. It, the down point of it a little bit is you don't see who you've saved, you see who you haven't saved. Mm-hmm. So, like, if it, if it happens again, like, you're thinking, oh, like, it's just that bit of a downer, but as long as we're still backing people, like, we don't know the victories that we actually do have in, in our point of view, so I hope, I hope we actually are helping people out there. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I definitely think you are, because, like, it's like you got a good platform to do it on from there, and then yourself, and yourself like, from there, it's like you're, you're a good role model to look up to. Uh, I wouldn't say that much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 the front face, anyway. You, you, see me, you, see me at, you see me at the pub on a Friday or a Saturday, you might say it a bit different, but yeah, I try, I try to be, I try, I try, I try to get out there, what's, what's, what I think's right, and yeah, just trying, trying to help a few people on the way, because where we are in the sport, it gives us that initiative, like, it gives us that platform kind of thing to to have that little bit of a higher voice and be seen just that little bit. So, yeah. And is there a way in particular sort of uh, other people can you get involved in some of the causes you support, like Quantum Mirko, or uh, is there, yeah, uh, any particular way you encourage people to get involved? Um, other than let everyone know that you're there for them, like, it's become more popular to share, share posts on... Uh, Sorry, I was changed up for a sec. Uh, to share things on Facebook, like um, if you see a page that's shared a video, or you see a page that's um, shared a quote, like share, it, like put it out there. Like if uh, you don't know, like someone could be scrolling Facebook for what they think is going to be the last time, and they see that and it pops up and it clicks something in their head that they're going to call their friend or or whatever. Or like you might be seeing something that says "always check in on your mates," and you, you think, "Oh, I'm going to call that person," and that could save their life. Like. That, that's how people get involved. Just send the messages out to people. Don't like share share as much as you can. Like, it, it is an awkward subject to talk about because you don't know how it affects certain people or how it doesn't. But like, it's just something everyone needs to get past, kind of thing. And if if everyone get a part of it, I think Sandy talking to Sandy the other day. They're actually um, her goal is to build. A, like a rec center on Stradbroke Island. That's where that's Quandamooka country. That's where that comes from. And she's actually registered Quandamooka as a charity now, nice. so they can actually re- receive donations and that. And we're actually working on a show. I can't say too much about it because I don't know what's going to happen with it. But I've come up with a little idea that maybe might get us a show, and we're going to if we like, we're, it's going to obviously have to be widely streamed to. to to, for anyone to view it now because of everything that's going on. Yeah. So if um, talking, if we have the stream out there, we're going to have like a little link on the thing down the bottom. Like, say, if you want to donate, donate here. Like, and know that it's an actual charity and it's not just going to like Beyond Blue or something that's actually going to help kids on Stradbroke Island make a difference. So if people want to get involved, if when that comes up, jump at the opportunity. If you have that spare five bucks or whatever that, to help that because Sandy's really trying to do a good job on Stradbroke Island and um, 
because that's where her two, I think it's her two nephews are from, and that's how everything started. Her two nephews committed suicide, and that's how she started this whole thing. So she wants to give back to Stradbroke Island and really, really help the kids there. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. It's like, um, so at, at the moment, so uh, can people donate now? Like, like, do we get in contact with Kwagamuka Cup and, and do donations? I'm not sure at the moment. I think if you just message Kwagamuka Cup about merch or whatever, like the proceeds mm-hmm. obviously go to go to Kwagamuka or like, yeah, I'm obviously got. To, I'm talking to Sandy tomorrow, and um, I'll ask her. I'll actually ask her what's going on. If that how people can help out. Yeah. I wasn't aware that, that people might be interested in. So yeah, now that I know, I'll ask how people can get involved more, and we'll see if we can come up with something from that. Yeah, definitely. I think mean, like especially like the, the Australian Muay Thai scene, and like in, in general co- combat sports in general, the Australian like we're pretty like supportive of each other. And, yeah. Like and especially there, like we know like now you see seeing like you know there's a face to it as well like and, and she's a very genuine person from all the posts that we see from there so it's just at least you know the money's going to go somewhere to the right to, yeah. to the right place yeah and if, you, if you've ever met sandy she's a lovely lady like she would give you the clothes off her back if you needed them like she's she's a legend and um yeah she's really tried to get um people who she thinks are actually going to make a legitimate difference mm-hmm. um make a difference put their like make a stand kind of thing and she she has rallied together a good team um, a good team I think relatable people like I hope that people see me as someone they can talk to about it or like like someone that since since I since I, I do I am an ambassador for it like if they do see me at a show or um, after one of my fights they feel like they can come up like I've had that before a young bloke in eruption came up to me and said how much it means to him and that he's had his own battles and that and, but that's just the little victories that we have and I hope that Sandy knows that she's actually is making a difference out there. Definitely. <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely think so. And like all the times I've, I've seen you fight and like being in the back room from there, you, you know, you're, you're a pretty, uh, you know, uh, approachable person, really. Always having a laugh, even like before fights and things like that. So like, yeah, like I said, like, like I said, like you probably might think you're a good role model, but just to see your demeanor at shows and how you treat everyone as equals, I think you're definitely a good role model. 100%. Yeah, at, at, at fights, we're just we're having fun. Like we're everyone looks so serious in their Wayne photos and shit. I'll always laugh when me and Eddie fought. We did the whole ducking. Yeah, <laughs> it's the eruption speedos. Like fuck, we're ready to have fun. Like at, at at the end of the day, like everyone takes fighting as this, like it's such a serious thing. Like obviously you could get hurt, but in the wide scheme of the world. Especially like looking looking at it now, it makes more sense. But in the wide scheme of the world, like it's such a little thing. What fighting is like, we're just there to have fun. Like we'll have music pumping, we'll be smiling, laughing. Like that's just that's that's the energy I like to bring. Like if we get backstage and we got music pumping, we like make other people like if if someone who's having their first fight or something or their second or third sees our energy, hopefully it projects on them and it might like make them fight better I was there thinking oh he's not nervous like what am I getting nervous about no you know like we're just having fun we're out there to make sure everyone's having fun pretty much just that's if you've never hung out with Danny he's a pretty different dude so <laughs> he's, he's always got a good energy and Andrew brings a good energy too like even after the fights like we like we have we have fun like yeah that's, that's what we're all about we're all about that community feel um so yeah that, that's, that's that's what we we like to bring we like to bring that approachable feel. Like we like having beers for everyone after the fight. Like at eruption, uh, when we stayed in the hotel, like a lot of the time we get chairs out in the car park and just yeah. talk shit, drinking beers out in the car park until four o'clock in the morning. Like after chaos, we didn't even sleep. We got in the car and drove home after not sleeping. Like we just, I, f- I feel like we're a friendly team and we like to involve everyone. Yeah, yeah. that's that's the best way, for it, isn't it? <laughs> Yeah, we're out there to have fun. Everyone just needs to chill a little bit, I think. Everyone takes shit too seriously. Like, mm-hmm. no, nice. That's the best That's way. a really good cool perspective. <laughs> yeah. Fighting's the fun part. Yeah, for real. <laughs> That's it. So what's your, what's your Instagram handle? Yeah, Instagram's just Charlie underscore. Yeah, Instagram's just Charlie underscore Bob 97. Mm-hmm. And then... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a fact. 
<laughs> cool. All right, well, look, thanks, Charlie, anyway, if you can hear us. <laughs> we'll just let you go, mate, for that one. Cheers for chat, chat, chatting thanks, to us. Thanks, boys. Okay, Cheers, Charlie. Cool. Thanks, mate. We'll catch you later. Cheers, boys. See you later. And we'll just finish off ourselves here. Yeah, really, we're here. All right. yeah. Cool. So, hopefully, I've done a lot of good editing, editing magic. Yes. And you didn't notice how much of a shit fight that last part was. <laughs> but, like, um, so there, yeah, follow Charlie on Instagram from that. Um, awesome. Talk to him from there. Also, for, like, you know, we'll, I'll put some show links like, yeah, Kramuka Cup from there. Like, it, it, it's a great organization for mental health. That, good to get behind. And they do fight shows as well that, you know, that put out some pretty good content. Um, and for us, fellas from there, like, yeah, um, well, I got my, we got an outro now, so I don't have to say our Instagram here. Just <laughs> listen around for the, for yeah. the outro so I just don't mess it up. That one. And we'll, we'll catch you next time. Okay. See ya. Yeah.